We've got a really power-packed morning today, so it's my pleasure now to introduce our second guest speaker for the morning, our second keynote, Archbishop Mark Coleridge. Now, I'm fortunate in that uh, Bishop Mark previously had been in the Archdiocese of Canberra and Goulburn, so I just happened to have acquired this photo from his time there in Canberra Goulburn to aid in my introduction. So this uh, indicates that Archbishop Mark has been in many places and done many things for the good of the church. In this particular image, he's being lifted up by a cherry picker to uh, be part of the blessing of the renovations to the cathedral in Goulburn, the original seat of the Archdiocese of Canberra and Goulburn. So he comes to us with great and incredible experience in the service of the church. Our second image... Our second image indicates that Bishop Mark's expertise and love of the liturgy means that he is deeply attentive to the most important aspects of our faith. And thirdly, if yesterday we were to say that Bishop Michael is known as the ecumenical bishop for his love of ecumenism, uh, Archbishop Mark is certainly known as a bishop with his great love for scripture. And it's not a closed book to him, it's an open book where he's very aware of the light that scripture brings to our lives and he uses all his skills, all his expertise and his love for scripture whenever he speaks in order to open the scriptures to us all. Would you please make Archbishop Mark very welcome. Thank you, Andrea. I can't see you all. I can see some of you now, a bit like the man in the gospel. I can see people, but they look like trees. That cherry picker was terrifying. I think I had a, a rather forced smile on my dial. Um, but I didn't realize it, it, it was, they're, they're so, I thought they were stable, they're not. And the reason I was going up was I had to throw holy water at a new mosaic on the side of the old cathedral. The governor general was there, so I was giving the, the royal wave to those down under. But in fact, I've never been so relieved in all my life to come back to earth again. And I was all dolled up in a satan. And if you've ever tried to put a harness on with a satan, you'll realize it's exceedingly awkward and uncomfortable. So despite the smile, I was both uncomfortable and terrified can't say that I'm either here. <laughs> As I listened to choir, I was struck by how different it is to watch someone in person and then to watch them on the screen, because we had both. You wouldn't have seen this choir. I presume you're still there. But uh, one of the shots that often came onto the screen was uh, choir's face with that, what I've always thought to be that dreadful logo for the year of faith. You know that boat with the cross on it? Can you get a shot of it? But I thought how magnificently appropriate it was. No, don't even try. How magnificently appropriate it was that here is this guy who has, as it were, been born from a rickety old boat, was there telling his story, and what a story it is, with that uh, logo in the background. And it really became, at least to me, quite compelling. Choir with the boat in the background. Now, what's true of choir <clears throat> is also true of Jesus Christ. There are very different angles on him and the shot can make all the difference. And in a sense, it's really Jesus seen from different angles that I want to talk about. Because if we talk about a year of grace... We are, in the end, talking about a year of Jesus Christ because he is the grace. The grace isn't some vague abstraction. It's as concrete as a person because once we look to the figure of Jesus, we see that Jesus has, or the grace rather, has a name and it has a face. See, again, the God of the Scripture, the, the only real God that we will ever know, is a God who is embarrassingly concrete. And the same is true of grace. 
I mean, when I was a kid, I think I thought of grace being poured into my soul like some sparkling liquid from on high, an abstraction in that sense. But what I have come to see as I've made the journey of faith through life to the age of 64 is that we're not talking about some heavenly liquid poured into the container of my soul. We are talking about the incredible gift of uh, the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ. Now, I gather yesterday Bishop Michael told you something of how the year of grace came to be. Well, let me just amplify a little of what I gather he said. It really came to be because the then president of the Bishop's Conference, the Archbishop of Adelaide, Philip Wilson, said that we had reached a point where we needed not only to take stock but also to plan for the future. And why was this so in his judgment? Because, not only in his judgment, but in the judgment of, of a number of the bishops, we had reached a point in the church in this part of the world where there were a number of disquieting phenomena, and I'm going to name some, if not all of them. A kind of politicisation of church life uh, that inevitably led to polarisation or leads to polarisation, division, dissension, uh, a lot of anger and frustration, some of it justified, some of it not. Uh, a weariness of spirit, the sense among some, perhaps many, that the dazzling agenda of the Second Vatican Council had in fact lost momentum or had been betrayed. A certain negativity that comes, all of that in a kind of a maelstrom, leading to a point where we had to take stock of things as they are, not as we might want them to be, but as they really are. And bishops in the end, you may not believe this, but bishops in the end tend to be realists. So for the, not just for the bishops, but for the whole church to cast the, 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 the eye of realism upon where we are and then on the basis of that perception to plan for the future. What Archbishop Wilson said is that we need a big ecclesial event in order for this to happen and what he proposed was a synod, a national synod, a bit like the Second Vatican Council gone national. Now, the proposal was bold, but it didn't win the support of all the bishops. And what do you do when you can't agree? Well, you set up a committee. And again, I think Michael spoke yesterday of that committee, of which he and I were both members. And what we eventually proposed was a journey of discernment that would lead us to a point where we may be able to make a decision about this big ecclesial event that is required at this time. So that's where the year of grace came in. We gave it that name, some were a bit unhappy about the name, but eventually it settled, it landed, and I think it's been a good name. But what is, the year of grace is intended to be more like a retreat than anything else. In other words, a journey of discernment. The whole church, not just the bishops, but the whole church on a journey of discernment through a year of grace, at the end of which we would be perhaps at a point where we can say perhaps we need a synod or some other big church event that will enable us to plan for the future and, and to stir the energies that genuine planning would require. Because sometimes, look, pastoral planning can be a sophisticated form of palliative care. And I mean... None of us surely is interested in that. And I hear it uh, from time to time that, that the church is going out of business, you know, put up the sign, you know, closing down sale, get rid of the brick and brack, the brick or brack. But, but we don't want a pastoral planning that is a, a form of palliative care. We want something else. Now, new evangelization is a word or a phrase rather that trips from the tongue. My fear at times is that it can become like a mantra. You know, you say it often enough and it's just going to happen. I think perhaps we should give the phrase a bit of a rest and talk about an, the new surge of gospel energy that we do need in the church at this time. Now, you might sit back and say, well, this is not the time for a new surge of gospel energy. We're in survival mode. We're like Quar and his mob on the boat. This is about survival, not some kind of new surge or flourishing. 
But if you look back across the 2,000 years, the journey of Christians through time, very often the great new surges of gospel energy have come against the tide in moments that have been desperate, where the church has been down for the count. I mean, consider what happened in the wake of the Reformation, that great sundering of Latin Christianity from which we're still recovering. You had the, the, the great surge of gospel energy that should never have happened up over the falls in Ecuador, uh, the, the great surge led by communities like the Jesuits, and we've just got our first Jesuit Pope who's picking up some of this language too. Uh, consider what happened in France after the French Revolution where the church was reduced to almost nothing. There was this incredible new surge of gospel energy that led to the founding of all these orders. Many of them have come to Australia and the Pacific. They were the great missionaries in the Pacific. They used to say, drop a Frenchman on a Pacific island, wish him well, bonne chance, uh, come back 30 years later. Everyone was Catholic and everyone spoke French. So that's, th this, this shouldn't have happened. But the great surges of gospel energy, in that sense, should never have happened or should never happen. So we're, we're, we're in that boat in the West, and Australia is part of the West. That, that uh, We're not down for the count, but by heck, we're under pressure in all kinds of ways. The most obvious way is sexual abuse, but it's, only, it's one of the many, the most dramatic and perhaps the most important. But in so many other ways too, we are under pressure. It's less evident in our schools, I agree, but that can mask the reality. But the fact, the fact that we are under pressure doesn't mean to say at all that the great surge can't happen or that it won't happen. And what I am more and more convinced is that the great catch is always just around the corner. You know, it's like Peter, he's, he's the professional fisherman. He's been out fishing all night, he's caught not a single fish. And then he comes in and there's Jesus, the rabbi, who wouldn't know one fish from another, says, throw the nets overboard. Well, Peter knows the lake and he knows there are no fish. There's no great catch to be had. But if you say so, just to keep you happy, I'll chuck the nets over. Over the nets go and in comes the great catch. The great catch, in fact, is always just around the corner. And if we're fooled into thinking otherwise, then of course there will be no catch because we won't even throw the nets over. Fish are very hard to catch by hand and unless we throw the nets over, there won't be the great catch, but it's there against all the odds and against all the evidence. And I throw in at this point, just as a footnote, that uh, Bishop Vincent Long, our first Vietnamese-born bishop, he, uh, he was like choir, came on a boat rickety old thing at the age of about 18 or 19, so he was a lot older than Qua. But Vincent, at the age of 49, was made a bishop in Australia. It's in, his is an incredible story too. And he took, I think, magnificently as his Episcopal motto, the words of Luke's Gospel, Duc in altum, cast out into the deep. And there he not only echoes the words of the Gospel, but tells the story of his own life. Vincent, in a sense, is living proof of the great catch. So that, that's really what the year of grace is all about, to prepare us in some genuine way and some deep way for the great catch, that new surge of gospel energy that we have, that successive popes at least have called a new evangelization. It's happened before in the life of the church. Why the heck can't it happen now is the question. Of course it can, but if we think it can't, then almost certainly it won't. What we decided to do then, with, once we decided to undertake this journey of discernment called the Year of Grace, we decided to take as our, our guiding light, as, as it were, a document, a letter, a long letter, written by Pope John Paul II at the end of the year 2000, which was the year of the Great Jubilee, you might remember, the millennium. At the end of that, uh, that journey of celebration, of jubilation, he, he wrote this letter which bears the rather clumsy Latin name Novo Millennio in Eunte. Uh, I have it in my bag but I didn't bring it to the stage. Leave it in the bag. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. It's a letter to the whole church where he tried to, as it were, 
pick the eyes out of the intense and, and, and incredibly varied experience of the Jubilee year. And at one point of that letter, he says, if I were asked, what was the great fruit of that journey of jubilation through the year 2000? He, would, he says, I would unhesitatingly say the, uh, the, contempl- the, new, the fresh contemplation of the face of Christ which enabled us to start afresh from Christ, which are exactly the words that you see on the banners that are here on the stage. Start afresh from Christ. That's what we need to do if we're going to have this new surge of gospel energy. Starting afresh doesn't mean indulging in the cultivated amnesia that you see, say, in Pol Pot's regime where he declares it to be year one. You know, the past is simply abolished. That's not the way we work, either in biblical religion or Christianity more specifically. For us, it's always back to the future. All right, so, so it's not... We're not interested in any kind of forgetting or cultivated amnesia. Uh, We are about going back, but in order to go forward. So we start afresh by looking back and then looking ahead. But you've got to start afresh from Christ. Does that sound obvious? It's not. If I could just reflect on this for a moment. And reflect on it in a very basic way. If I ask the the, the question, the almost embarrassingly simple question, what is Christianity? Now again, you teachers in Israel, you know what Christianity is. Or do you? See, people sometimes think, at least unconsciously or implicitly, that Christianity is kind of like a philosophical system or a a moral code, or a set of values. And how often do we hear talk of gospel values? Okay. Or some kind of, uh, our opponents would see Christianity often as some kind of ideological package. Others would see it as a political program. Now, I'm the first to agree that Christianity at least implies or produces a philosophy, or philosophies, plural. I haven't got the slightest doubt that it does involve morality, ethics. I don't doubt either that it implies values. It can become ideology, though usually when it's gone rotten, religion when it degenerates, turns bad, inevitably puts on the mask of ideology the dark mask. And then as for politics, well, of course it, it implies a political engagement. I mean, the alternative is, is what some would, would, would press very hard at this time, to push Christianity and, in fact, all religion into some little corner and turn us into church mice. That's not the way it works. It's not the way biblical religion works and it's certainly not the way the Catholic mode of Christianity works. We are engaged with the public square, not as a political party. We don't (coughs) do partisan politics. But we are engaged in the public domain. And we rebel against those who would say, no, religion is strictly a private affair. No, it's not. It's intensely private in one sense, or intensely personal, but because it's so deeply and intensely personal, it is also comprehensively public. So Christianity, it picks up elements of all those descriptions, but none of those capture what Christianity is at its heart. What it is at its heart, and here again I echo the words of John Paul II, not in that letter of 2000, but in the the letter he wrote to the whole church just after he was elected Pope way back in October 1978. Back in that first letter, and this is the Pope of Rome, He said, Christianity, in one sense, is not a conventional religion at all. It doesn't fit the the standard description. He said, because Christianity at its heart is an experience. It's not a system or a code or, or a method. It's an experience. Of what? An experience of encounter. Encounter with whom? 
an encounter with Jesus Christ risen from the dead, who's not once upon a time, but who's here and now, or is nowhere and never. This is a crucial point. Not long before I left Canberra to come to Brisbane over a year ago, I had four school leaders to lunch at Archbishop's house. This was something that I did then and I will try to do in Brisbane as well. I thought one of the better things that I attempted in those days. Now, there are no free lunches at Archbishop's house. So at the end, towards the end of the meal, I said to these excellent young, uh, two boys, two girls, at the end of their Catholic schooling, I said, now listen, at the end of your journey of education, who is Jesus, do you think? What would you say about him? And it was a fascinating discussion. And at the end of the discussion, they agreed that Jesus was the supreme role model who, who had, they, they had to strive to emulate through their lives. And I said to them as nicely as I could, well, if that's all Jesus is, Christianity isn't worth the effort. See, because Je Jesus may be, in fact he is, a role model. But if that's all he is, a role model who lived once upon a time, the pale-faced Galile Galilean, he's not much good to you or me. We don't need another role model. And we've got plenty of them. It's like if Jesus was just a wise teacher. Who cares? We've got lots of wise teachers. If Jesus was just another miracle worker, in the end, who cares? We've got lots of them too. We need something more. And the something more is Jesus Christ who was crucified. They saw him strung up, executed in the most horrific way known to the ancient world. They saw that happen. And they saw the battered, brutally scarred body laid eventually in a tomb. And then they met him. They encountered him in ways they didn't expect. They were not sitting around saying, Jesus, what time, what time is he going to rise? They didn't. And you read those stories that we're reading in these Easter days, you can see it, it, they didn't have a clue what was going on. They're amazed. And that's the word that John Paul II used in that first letter. The experience of encounter with him is an experience of amazement. And he said, that's what the gospel is. And that's what Christianity is. An experience of amazement. So in that sense, what are our schools? Schools of amazement in a world where so often people, particularly the young, are deeply and dangerously bored. Why are they bored? Because the world gets too small. They're created for amazement and ecstasy. And what do they find? The exact opposite. The world shrinks and shrinks and shrinks until the world becomes a tomb, as it were. I mean, they should be the least bored people that have ever trod the planet. They've got everything you could possibly imagine. Big houses to live in, cars to drive, places to go on holidays, magnetic island, too much food to eat, good grog to drink. Why should, but, but they're like kids who go to open a fridge full of food and say, Mum, there's nothing to eat. Or Burke and Wills, who died in the desert of hunger, starvation, when the local indigenous heard that, they thought it was hilarious. For them, it was like dying in a supermarket. There was food all around, they just couldn't see it. Okay, so an experience of amazement. And what is amazing about this experience, Christ who just comes out of nowhere at us, it's not something we plan or even expect, comes out of nowhere. And what do we see when we see him? We see the truth of God. And it blows our mind because it's so much stranger than any of the tin pot gods we concoct for our own supposed solace. The real God is so much stranger and more magnificent than anything we dreamt of. But you not only see the truth of God when you encounter the risen Christ, you see the truth of the human being. In that sense, you see the truth of who you are. You know, the words of Emily Bronte in Wuthering Heights, where Kathy says to Nellie the housekeeper about Heathcliff, he is more myself than I am. Same with the risen Christ, he's more yourself than you are. And what do you see, the truth of yourself? 
When Jesus Christ rises from the dead, he loses none of his scars. And he was brutally scarred. You saw Mel Gibson's film. It, it was over the top, but it wasn't too far over the top. The whole process that led finally to the death on the cross was a brutal process that would have left him horribly scarred, enough said. Now, at the end of that film, there was a, a rather pallid evocation of the risen Christ in, in soft focus. You didn't see the face. You just saw this, this, this rather fine body, uh, in, again in soft focus, with five wounds, hands, feet and side. Okay? Now, in fact, he would have had a lot more than five wounds. And he loses not one of them when he rises from the dead. The only difference when he rises from the dead is that the scars shine like the sun. That's why he says to Thomas in the gospel we heard the other day, come on Thomas, touch the, touch the wounds, put your finger in them and understand what you're touching. That these were in fact the emblems of a most atrocious defeat, or so it seemed, and understand in touching them that you are now touching the great trophies of an unimaginable triumph, the scars that shine like the sun. And that's the truth of the human being. The truth of the human being, you and me, is that you, we are scarred in all kinds of ways. That's not the issue. We're wounded, scarred. But the promise that, that comes to us it, it, when we see and hear the risen Christ is that there is no scar that cannot shine like the sun. There is no wound that cannot become a fountain, to use the Johannine image. That, to, to encounter him, that's Christianity. And that's amazing. Now, everything else comes as a spin-off. All our philosophizing, very important. Uh, all our, our, our moral effort. All our ethics. All our public engagements are consequences of the encounter and not substitutes for it. Because if any of that stuff becomes a substitute for the encounter with the risen Christ here and now, then Christianity will become what one author that I read recently called an entrenched moralism. And people are rightly sick to death of Christianity understood and experienced as an entrenched moralism. Uh, the, the words were the words of, he, he's a Queenslander, in fact, though, I didn't know that until I finished the book. It's a book called Journey to the Inner Mountain, written by a guy called James Cowan. Now, Cowan is not a believer in any conventional sense, and I don't think he's Christian, but he's clearly one of these spiritual searchers, and he became fascinated by, as I am personally, by one of the most haunting and important figures in Christian history, the, the man we know as Antony of Egypt. Uh, who, who really is one of the giants. He's one of those who, who like Francis of Assisi and Benedict of Norcia, uh, brought to birth not only a new way of being Christian, but a, uh, a new form of human consciousness, and in the end, a new civilization. He's the father of, Western mona of, of Christian, not just Western. He's the father of Christian monasticism. A and the historical and cultural impact of a figure like that is impossible to overstate. Now, at the end of this, this book, fascinating book on, uh, on Antony of Egypt, where, where James Cowan follows Anthony's path into an ever deeper silence and solitude and eventually ends up going to, to Antony's inner mountain, the cave overlooking the Red Sea where Antony lived the last part of, of his exceedingly long life. But at the end of this book, he says this. He says, people have grown weary of Christianity understood and experienced as an entrenched moralism, I'll come back to what that means, stripped of all poetry and extreme life. Those words leapt off the page at me and, and they've settled in my, in my mind and heart and soul ever since. Because what haunts Cowan and me about Antony of Egypt is precisely, you see in him, a quality of poetry and extreme life that looked like madness. Same, it's supremely in Jesus. Uh, it's, it's also found overwhelmingly in a figure like St. Benedict, and it's also found in a figure like St. Francis of Assisi. 
whose name the new pope has taken. And I can only hope that the new pope, as the successor of Peter, and therefore the, the, the first witness of the resurrection, will lead us more deeply, all of us, uh, into that experience of, of the poetry and extreme life which is in the crucified and risen Christ. Now, back to extreme moral, uh, to, to entrenched moralism. What it means is Christianity understood, and this, this, is, this is the opposite of grace that I'm about to evoke, it's understood as being basically a good boy or a good girl. And, and you've got to try very hard to be better, um, to be a better boy and a better girl. And, and the sense is this, that there is a great big high mountain. And on the top of that mountain, shrouded in mists of majesty, there sits God. And your task is to get from the foot of the mountain up to the summit. Because on that mountain, the Lord of hosts has prepared the great banquet. And you know that you were not made for the foot of the mountain, you were made for the banquet, the feast on the summit. So you have to get from the foot of the mountain to the top of the mountain where God is. So off you go. And it's excruciatingly hard work. You slip and fall, almost break your leg, almost break your neck, almost lose your life. You're bruised and battered and bloodied and broken. But eventually you scramble to the top of the mountain and you fall exhausted at the feet of God who takes one look at you and says, not good enough. Boing, and down you go. To the foot of the mountain in the great cosmic game of snakes and ladders to begin all over again to do something that in the end you know you can't do. Now, if that's what Christianity is, then it's satanic. But that's not what Christianity is. And now, let me describe for you the truth of grace in the same terms. There is a mountain... You and I are at the foot, and God is on the top, and that's where the banquet is for which you were created. But you don't have to do it yourself, because what happens is God comes down. That's what we mean when we talk about the incarnation, to which I shall return in a moment. God comes down to us. And we're not the one who's bruised and battered and bloodied and broken. Who is God? Have a look at Jesus on the cross. God comes down to get us, to put us on his shoulders and carry us up to the feast and sit us down at the banquet and wait on us. It's incredible. But that's the truth. But then what happens is God comes down in Jesus to get us and we run away saying, no thanks, I can do this on my own. No, you can't, but you don't have to. Jesus then comes looking for us, the one who's looking for the lost sheep, and finds us, puts us on the shoulders, carries us up the mountain, and the feast unfolds. A word about the incarnation. This business of contemplating the face of Christ can sound quite unusual but what it is is contemplating the humanity of God that which as it were distinguishes us most as human beings is our face so what are we meaning when we're talking about contemplating the face of Christ we're talking about contemplating the face of God the humanity of God the God who takes flesh and becomes one of us now in the early years of the last century, there was a French Catholic writer, a guy called um, uh, Charles Peggy. Charles Peggy. And Peggy, in one of his writings, said that 
even among the devout, and I guess most of us qualify in that category more or less, there is an implicit denial of the incarnation. And he described this as a mystical disaster. Un désastre mystique. Now, what's he mean by that? He means by that that people think that in order to find their way to the divinity, they have to deny their humanity or escape from it. And, and the effects of this are everywhere to be seen. I think Piggy is absolutely spot on. We don't really believe that God became and becomes one of us. And every heresy that the church has ever known, in the end, is a denial of the flesh, saying the flesh is bad, and therefore saying God could not possibly have taken flesh. So it all comes back to the good old body, but not just the body, but the flesh of creation, matter. Matter matters to a religion that says in its creed, we believe in the resurrection of the body. When Jesus rises from the dead, he's no ghost. Again, those Easter stories make it very clear. They think at first he's a ghost. He says, come on, I'm not a ghost, touch me, see me, hear me. If you've got something here to eat and he actually eats a bit of fish, he's not a body as I am or you are. He's moved into some new dimension of human life. He can walk through doors and all of that and it seems appear out of nowhere, but he's still a body. So we are not those who shuffle off the body to become spiritual. Forget that, that's demonic. Wrong way, go back. So contemplating the face of Christ is a way of, of contemplating the humanity of God in a way that enables us to discover the amazing truth of who God really is and the amazing truth of who the human being really is, and then the amazing truth of how those two interact. That's the truth of Christianity, and that's the truth of grace. And it's not just a matter of God helping us when we need help. I, one of the things I've done in my years as bishop is been uh, mightily involved in the business of, the controversial business of the retranslation of the Missal. Now, one of the things that I, I discovered once I began to look at these, uh, the, the Latin text very closely and the translations that I'd grown up with was that very often a strong word in Latin that really means enable or make me or empower me to do something was translated, all those different strong verbs in Latin were translated in English as help, help us. But it's not really what the, what the prayers are saying. Because the cumulative effect of, of the help, 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 help thing is to give the impression that God only helps us when we can't. It's a bit like teaching a kid to ride a bicycle. You teach a kid to ride a bike by holding onto the bike because if you don't, the kid will fall off. But at some point, you sense that the kid's got his or her balance on the bike and you let go, you hope that the kid rides off into the future. She or he's got the, got the balance. Now... That's not the way it is with God if we're talking what the church believes and teaches about grace. The truth is, if God ever lets go of the bike, there's no bike. There is no point at which we can take our leave from God. And if we think there is, or if we think we can do it on our own, then we fall victim to what has been called the great heresy of the West. Now, I don't want you being heretics... Pelagianism, Pelagius the Welsh monk who said basically we can do it on our own if we try hard enough. Uh, you can't do it on your own. Here I'm echoing St. Augustine. You can't do it on your own. But the thing is you don't have to do it on your own. And yet the satanic con is to cast Christianity in those terms and to leave it as an entrenched moralism stripped of all poetry and extreme life. So I just ask you, I, I, I give you the question, what does it mean for us at this time to enter more deeply into the poetry and extreme life 
that is in Jesus Christ crucified and risen. To do that means to become a saint. And if you look at vocations in the church, which are very important, the right kind of leadership, perhaps more important than ever. And I don't just mean ordained leadership. The far greater reality in the life of the church is what I would call charismatic leadership, which can be exercised by anyone. So vocation. The young are drawn to those communities where they find or sense the poetry and extreme life. If all they sense is an entrenched moralism, they're not interested, and nor should they be. To speak about the incarnation, I might just add in passing, is not just to look to the figure of Jesus, but also to the community that we call the body of Christ, the church. See, there are those who see the mess of the church. And I as a bishop, and I'm sure Michael would agree with me here, see more of the mess of the church than just about anyone else in this room. But the church has always been a mess. There was no golden age. Sometimes people give the impression that there was a golden age once upon a time when we got it all perfectly right. Then something went wrong fairly early on and we've been running downhill ever since. Now, whatever about Luke's somewhat idealised portrait of the early church in the Acts of the Apostles, go and read the earlier texts of Paul's letters, if you want to see what I mean by mess. But we've got problems, but we haven't got the problems, that, the, the dreadful problems we had to deal with, say, in Corinth. In other words, the church was a mess from day one. There was blood on the floor. That's not the issue. I mean, I don't rejoice in the fact that the church is a mess, but it's just it is a fact. And if you're looking for the church of the perfect, and sometimes the media give the impression that that's what we're, we're supposed to be, that then you're going to be bitterly, bitterly disappointed. And again, I'd say, wrong way, go back. Uh, but if you're looking for the body of Christ, you are going to find a mess, but you're also, if you, if you have the, the, the eye that sees, in other words, that X-ray vision we call faith, more of which in a moment, then you see the magnificence of the heart of the mess. It's a bit like looking at Jesus as they did and said, oh, he's the carpenter's son. We know his relatives. You can look at the, the church, see the mess and say, it's a corpse. It's over. The only thing it can do on its own is putrefy. But if you see the magnificence of the heart of the mess, you see something else. And the magnificence is not, God knows, you know, the architecture of the Vatican or something. The magnificence is the presence here and now of Jesus Christ crucified and risen. If you see him, it's not that the mess goes away, but the wounds can become fountains and the scars can shine like the sun. That's the mystery of the Lord's cross, which, which is the blazing fire at the heart of the church. But if you can't see him, the magnificence of the heart of the mess, then of course you only see the mess and of course the church is only a corpse. But if you do see him, then you see a body wounded but still aglow with the radiance of the risen Christ, aglow with the life that is bigger than death. And that's the truth of the church, which is no human concoction. God knows if it were, it would have keeled over centuries ago. This is the work of God, but it's a work in flesh. And that's where the mess comes in. We had proclaimed the year of grace and set out on this journey of discernment when out of the blue the former Pope, Pope Benedict XVI, proclaimed to the Universal Church the year of faith. And at first we thought, oh no, we've been skittled by the Pope. Why didn't he tell us? Um, but then we thought again and came to see that the year of grace proclaimed by Pope Benedict was magnificently 
harmonious with the year of grace and in that sense seriously providential. What do I mean? Faith is simply the human response to the gift which we call grace, the gift of love. Now that response can be more difficult than it sounds because the gift of the perfect love can also be more difficult than it sounds. Let me just reflect briefly upon the love of God, which is grace. The free and unearned and unearnable love, the perfect love in a world that doesn't believe in love often and certainly doesn't believe in the, po the, the possibility of perfect love. Here is the gift given to you. It costs you nothing. Costs you absolutely nothing. But the love is strange. Like, just as Jesus is strange. You know, all those faces of Jesus we were looking at earlier, a lot of them don't strike any chord in me at all because they're not strange enough. You know, a, a poet friend of mine once described Jesus in the Gospels as being as direct and as distant as lightning. That's absolutely perfect. Or that strange combination that you, you find in him in the Gospels where he is, um, he's unbelievably authoritative but never authoritarian and he's unbelievably intimate. He goes right to the heart of others. He, he knows what's in a human being. Unbelievably intimate in the genuine sense but never matey. He, he's a strange and, and, and wondrous figure. And that's why I, I've never seen a, a cinematic, choir work on this, I've never seen a cinematic representation of Jesus that even comes, comes close to cutting the ice with the, uh, the strangeness of the, uh, and, and the, the wonder of the figure that meets us in the Gospels. Now, it's always hard to translate great and haunting texts onto the screen. Uh, I, I, give, I mentioned Wuthering Heights earlier. Wuthering Heights, as far as I can see, as soon as it's filmed, becomes just another love story. You lose all those deep, dark resonances that you find in Emily Bronte's great book. Similarly, Moby Dick, once it's filmed, it, it becomes an adventure story about a, a whale. But in fact, when you read Herman Melville's great novel, you, you get all these extraordinary resonances and overtones, many of them biblical or Shakespearean. That they, they're very hard to capture on the screen. Similarly, The Great Gatsby, that, that strange, haunting uh, quality that's in Scott Fitzgerald's prose, you, you can't do on the screen somehow. It's a bit like that with Jesus. So, so my, all I'm saying is that, that, that Jesus in the Gospels uh, is strange, but strange with the strangeness of the love of God. See, the love of God is not nice. And in fact, it, it has its violence because it's, it's total in its claim. In that sense, it comes at us like a tsunami, uh, claiming everything. We want to pay God off, give him something, but not everything. But this is the love that says, no, I claim everything. That's what I mean by tsunami. It just comes at us out of nowhere and claims everything. And we, we can experience it as a kind of violence, an assault without recognising that it's love. There's a, a little parable that some of you may know where a, a man was, grew tired of life and he decided not to commit suicide. He thought that wasn't the way to go. What he did instead, he went out and bought a great big corrugated iron tank and he furnished it with all the necessities of life. He had a bed to sleep on, a desk to work on, books to read and even a nice crucifix on the wall to remind him of God and help him to pray. So there he, in his tank he lived a life uh, free of all the dreadful pressures of life that had so worn him down. But there was one great problem. Morning and evening without fail, volleys of bullets would rip through the walls of his tank. Now, he didn't know who the hell was firing on him, and all he could do was lie on the floor to avoid being shot. Although eventually, he began to use the bullet holes for a positive purpose. He'd look out and he'd see the kids playing and the birds feeding on heads of grass, life outside the tank. Now, eventually... The tank rusted and fell apart and he walked out of it with little regret. And there standing in front of him was the man with the gun. And the guy who'd come from the tank said, uh, I know you're going to kill me now, but just answer me one question before you kill me. Why are you my enemy when I've never done you any harm? And then the guy with the gun 
simply put the gun down and smiled at the other guy and said, I am not your enemy. And the man who'd come from the tank looked and he saw that there were scars on the other man's hands and feet and these scars shone like the sun. Now that's what I mean. The love that literally shoots the hell out of us. Uh, this is not a pleasant experience. It's not always comfortable. But that's the love that saves. So that just as we can trivialise evil from which we are saved, so too we can trivialise the love or sentimentalise the love that does the saving. The love of God can scour the soul. Grace can be a stern, severe grace. I actually think the thing like the Royal Commission is severe, stern grace. But grace that scours the soul, not of the individual, but of a community. I can remember one particularly difficult moment in my life. It was one of the most difficult moments I've had to face in my adult life. I prayed with uh, an intensity that was very, very rare. Um, and the only reply that came back to me was silence. Nothing was said and there was nothing done. God did not intervene in the way that I had begged. Now the challenge at a point like that is to, to discover the grace. Because it's tempting to say there is no God and plenty say that. Or there is no God who cares or listens but to say the silence and the inaction are grace and to discover how, that this was the love that did not speak or act because it was the love that scoured the soul and that was the creative purpose. At the end of jo the, the Diary of a Country Priest, Bernard Nuss's uh, book, uh, the dying priest is made to say at the end, uh, in French, tout est grave et tout est grâce. Everything is grave and everything is grace. Now, again, what this means is that there is no dark corner or depth that Jesus has not entered on Calvary. Because if there were, that dark depth or corner would be unredeemed or unredeemable. Jesus has entered every conceivable darkness, every dark corner of your heart and mine, every dark depth of human experience, individual and communal. The only question is, where is he? And that's the question is, where is the grace? Jesus is everywhere. You know, the, the Emmaus story, when he vanishes from their sight just as their eyes are open, seems weird would have made much more sense to say, oh, Jesus, it's you, we didn't know it was you, where you've been, how's this happened? And it, he just vanishes from their sight. Why? Because once your eyes are open to see him, you don't need him sitting physically across the table because you see him everywhere, you drown in him. There is no place that he is not. So even in the most horrendous situations, he's there. It's only a question of, have I got the eye to see where and how he's there. And that's the question about grace. Faith is simply opening the door to that love. I said the love is a tsunami in some ways, you the Psalms, your torrents and all your waves have swept over me. That is true, but the other truth, and this is paradoxical, is that this is a God who, who does not kick the door down. A God who is a great respecter of human freedom. This again is very strange. But God wants to work with us. You know, that's true from the first page of the Bible. That revolutionary understanding of the human being, not as a slave of God, but as a co-creator with God. When God says, come here, name the creatures. I could do it, but I want you to help me. You, you, join with me co-create with me, order the chaos by naming the creatures. This is revolution. So this is what faith is. Faith is simply opening the door to the love that can be violent, 
or seem violent, is always strange, but which is the, the only power that can, can save us and can turn even death into life as we celebrate at Easter time. In all of this, what I am saying is that this journey of discernment through the year of faith and the year of grace, they're the same journey. Faith and grace, you can't have one without the other. So this is a single great journey of discernment for the church in Australia, uh, where, where we've been overtaken by many things. And we can, get, we can blur our focus. I mean, in the Diocese of Townsville, I know with Michael's story as it, as it is, the dramatic turn that it's taken, this, this has overtaken many of us and many of you, I know. Uh, and not just in, in this diocese, but uh, throughout the nation and around the world. And then, then with the resignation of, of Pope Benedict and the election of Pope Francis, I mean, it, it, the, the intensity of all of this can... Um, Again, the torrents and waves can sweep over us. And I presume a gathering like this is precisely an attempt to stop in the midst of all of that maelstrom and, and, and to focus again on the journey of discernment and to remember, in the face of the creeping amnesia, why it is we undertook the journey. What does it involve? Uh, whose face are we seeking? And what do we hope to achieve at the end of this journey? I conclude by, by reminding you of something that is easily forgotten, and that is that the Second Vatican Council was not just about rearranging the furniture in, the, in the, the house of the church. It wasn't a churchy affair. It was an attempt beyond the ash heaps of Auschwitz in Hiroshima to position the church and equip the church for the new surge of gospel energy with which I began. In other words, if we talk about contemplating the face of Christ, it is a contemplation only and always for the sake of mission. We've got to go down, 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 down through these days of grace. But only in order to go out, 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 out. It's like those great trees up in this part of the world, in those rainforests. Incredible, the height of them. But they can only go up that high, reaching for the sun, because they go down so deep with these incredible root systems. What you see there in nature is absolutely true of the Christian life. So grace is Jesus. He's the only answer to the ash heap. So we've got a future beyond Auschwitz and Hiroshima. At times you can doubt it, any future worth having. But he, he's the only way beyond the ash heaps of, of Auschwitz and Hiroshima, or beyond any of the ash heaps of the world or the ash heaps of, of your own heart. There is no other answer that God has provided. He hasn't got any more to give. He's given us everything in Jesus, but only if we have an eye that sees the everything, a hear that, an ear that hears the everything, and a heart that loves everything that is in him, and then is prepared to share everything with everyone. Thank you.